Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober and part of the sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, first things first, congratulate everyone who celebrated. And uh, what I learned a long time ago is that anniversaries are not so much for the celebrant, although we embrace that when we do get a coin, uh, embrace it out of gratitude. Uh, it's really about uh, showing someone who's new or someone who's been bouncing in and out for a long time uh, that the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous do work contrary to some of the beliefs that are out there, that AA doesn't work anymore. Um, and what I said earlier about the age of miracles is still with us. They wrote that in the big book in the first edition, and it still proves to be true. Because with God, all things are possible. And what the mind wants to do is deny the existence of God, especially when uh, uh, thunderbolts hit. But sometimes we go in and we reach out to other people, and they seem to become our appointed teachers, our sponsors. And as long as we're in a place of willingness to follow directions, we get coins. We get one year, we get five years, we get ten years. And, um, you know, the first couple of years, it's, it's about us getting the coin and, and, and look at what has happened. And after a while, you realize you're taking a coin uh, just for a newcomer. Uh, quick story. Um, I got my second year birthday in AA. I was in Brooklyn. And um, I took the coin and, and had a couple of speakers, and I got to say a few things. Um, And I didn't know at the time, this guy walked into his first AA meeting ever. And he told me this uh, down the road, uh, maybe a couple of years later. And uh, he said, you know, that was the first meeting I ever walked into. And I didn't know what was going on. There was a cake. There was coins. There was all this, you know, this uh, hoopla about people celebrating. He said, but you're about my age. And um, I thought AA was for old people. And... um, He says, I saw a young guy, my age, making a two-year cake, and he says, well, maybe I can do this too. And it was just a little catalyst to get him over the fence to keep coming back. Now, I didn't know that at the time. God has a great way of keeping everything anonymous and quiet and keeping us right-sized. But that's what really anniversaries are about. Some people may scoff and mock at them, and other people may say, well, maybe me too. And I hope someone was sitting here tonight counting days and saying, I want a one-year coin. I want a five-year coin. I want a ten-year coin. I want to get up there and give a talk. Good. Use that. Your sponsor will tell you, make it quick and then sit down. But um, go for it because this is where we get well. So uh, congratulations to all. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. Um, I'm a recovered alcoholic. And if anyone's new and doesn't know what that means, follow me around. It's getting free from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body and getting free of alcoholism, the thing that accompanies this deal once we put down the drink. Because what I've learned the hard way, and I really mean that, uh, is that being separated from alcohol has little to do with being a recovered alcoholic. I'm no longer looking to be recovering anything, quite frankly. And some of the belief systems that we will hear is, I'm always going to be recovering, and if I get recovered, it doesn't mean I, mean I need AA, and that means I'm cured, and that's not what the big book is talking about. What the book talks about recover, when it says recovered, it means we've recovered from a single health state of mind and body. I'm no longer in a place of obsession, not in a place of uh, uh, craving or, or, or compulsion, and all hinges on my relationship with God. And the thing I I think I mentioned last week is that even though I'm separated from the substance, alcoholism goes underground and resurfaces in other areas, and they're called food sprees and thinking sprees and sex sprees and anger sprees and fear sprees, and I'm acting out. And my behavior is very inappropriate to someone who claims to be on a spiritual path, but my ego will justify all inappropriate behavior and make it very appropriate because it's me, and I'm a star, and it's okay for me to do, but don't you do it. And we'll sponsor men, we'll sponsor women and say, make sure you do this. And as soon as they leave our house, we go do just the opposite. And that's the reemergence of the ego. The illness never went away. And if I'm still doing something, it's not old behavior. It's very current behavior. And the ego will step right in and defend it. So for me, it has been about, regardless of how long I'm sober, it's about diving into this work at least once a year going through the work dismantling the ego, hopefully, experiencing further death to self for successful living, 
and finally get free, free of self, free of attachments to other things. And that's the great thing we can do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, those of us around here, while we'll look at um, unmanageability in the first step and think that applies just to the drink and the long year round, it really doesn't apply to a drink. I mean, it's always about the drink, but it's about other things. What's my current unmanageability look like? What am I experiencing now that's giving me disease and comfort even though I'm not drinking? So I'm very grateful for the teachers who showed me the way, didn't care about ruffling feathers, didn't care so much about my feelings. And then when I got up here to get a coin into sobriety, I realized what a great gift I've been given and who can I be of service to. We come to get and stay to give. And really as messengers of God, we shouldn't be here to eat anymore, but to give away everything we've been given. And for that, I'm really grateful. So as a recovered alcoholic, hopefully we're not living on page 52 anymore and experiencing the bedevilments, the things that torment, frustrate, and harass us. But we get past that. We transcend that, living in, in, in divine order, living along the line of God's will, rather than enforcing my will on everyone and telling God what my will should be, and he's got to follow. Because I run into fear, I run into me, I run into thinking all the time when I do that. One of the things about getting on this path and really getting free is letting go absolutely everything I thought was me is not me. Everything I think my life should look like is not the way my life should look like because it's all dictated by one predator, and that's the thinking mind. I have no idea what's good for me. 25 years later, my life is none of my business. But it, it, it's a matter of me on my knees surrendering to this power and asking him, allow me to follow his will, not my will. And sometimes when we're on this path and we go deeper into prayer, we go deeper into meditation, we go deeper into the steps, we go deeper into God's will, what the mind thinks is, okay, all the ducks are going to be in a row. I know exactly how it's supposed to play out. I'm going to have ease and comfort because I know exactly where I'm going. And quite frankly, it's often the opposite because we're going into a place, I went into a place very often that I never touched before, I never walked before. What do I know what God's will looks like until I'm in? And it's so strange and so foreign, we can recoil and go back to doing what we want to do and claim it's God speaking to me. The path with God is sometimes a dark one. It's an uncertain one. It's really about carrying the cross and wondering, okay, I'm going in. I don't know where I'm going. And it's a, a sense of disease and discomfort too, which ruffles a lot of feathers when you say that, but it's just a fact. The road walking with God, we're about to turn it over in step three, doesn't mean, okay, I turned it over, everything's going to snap into place. In fact, it might feel like everything's falling apart, and it is, because it's a direct to everything that I believe how God should look, how sobriety should look, how this walk should look. Once we lock in and completely surrender, then little by slowly things start to snap into place. And the things I thought made me, I realized I want nothing to do with. The things I were attracted to, I want nothing to do with. They're no longer attracting to me. I'm not drawn to negativity. I, I kind of recoil from that. Then we get to another place when we're truly in the sunlight of the spirit. I'm not running away from negativity. I'm not drawn to negativity. Like the drink, I'm placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. And at that point, that's when we or I become of maximum service to others. Newcomers or people coming back have the street on them like I did. It's negative. It's out there talk. War stories, cutting and, 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 and lying and all of that stuff. Well, if I'm recoiling from that, how could, I, how could I sponsor you? If I'm drawn into that, I certainly have no right sponsoring you. But on this path, when we get to 10, 11, and 12, we're truly journeymen. We're really in that. I'm placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I'm not stepping into your tornado, which makes me that much more useful. And our book says we're supposed to be effective agents for God. The mind has other, other ideas, though. The mind wants me dead, will take me back to that which is killing me. And in chapter agnostics, where we're introduced to step two, we're finding out that lack of power is my dilemma. That's what I found out right on page 45. Lack of power is my dilemma. That has been the most powerful statement for me all these years in the big book. It sums me up in a minute. I don't have power to tie my own shoelaces. Now, the ego wants no part of that. The ego wants to say, well, wait a minute. I know we have a problem with drinking, but I can handle some other stuff. I haven't let go, which means I'm going to run to serious trouble on this path. 
Because if I can take charge of this part of my life, I can take charge of that much of my life. And I'm, that's a form of dishonesty. And if I'm dishonest in one area of my life, I'm a liar. I'm dishonest. With God, with you, with me, and everything else. It says, this is a life which demands, and that suggests, demands rigorous honesty. Demands rigorous honesty. That's for everything. The mind has other, other ideas. Because who lives in the mind is this guy called the ego. He's got free room and board, a martini every time he wants one, a little lounge chair on the beach. He ain't leaving. And only through the power of God will we get power that we have no dilemma that little by slowly this ego gets grinded into dust. And hopefully the byproduct of that is humility. Now, I stay away from guys or women who say, I'm a really humble person. That means they're not humble at all. But it's in our actions that humility will speak volumes, not what we say. And it isn't even false humility with the oh, ah, shucks kind of attitude. But it's just in our walk, in our deportment. And we can only get, I can only get any kind of humility is having, by having a relationship with God. What the mind wants to do is show me what my God should look like, which means my God believes everything I believe. So if I'm resentful at you, God says, yeah, I'd be resentful too if I was you. And it goes on and on. And my mind says, well, I think God wants me to drink just to experiment once more. And I will do ridiculous things like this. So the walk with God is sometimes very uncertain. There's a great quote from, from someone, and he says, we're going on a path we never walked before and we're taking the direction we never took before to experience a God we never experienced before. And the only way I'm going to be able to see the path is by the light that burns in my heart to find God. I don't know about you, but my experience has been, looking back on it now, there's always been a hunger and a thirst for something it's inherent. It's in us. We all have like the God gene, but we get so far away from it. I was looking for God in the bottom of a bottle. I was looking God for God in, in the back of dark alleyways. I was looking for God all over the place, trying to find some sort of ease and comfort and contentment, some sort of rightness or okayness inside. Why should I turn to the power? I will find it in a bottle. And it worked. It worked for a little while. It gave me ease and comfort. I felt power. I felt invincible. This is what I've been looking for, utopia. But it turns in its flight like a boomerang. Then I can't get off the pipe. I can't get away from the syringe. I can't get away from the bar. I can't get away from whatever I'm doing. And then there's no more God. It's, it's, it's horror. It's pain. It's hell. And then we get separated via detox, jail cell treatment, or just come in AA and shake, rattle, and roll in the chairs. But we're not much better. And one of the belief systems that we have to challenge as sponsors, telling the newcomer, being separated from the substance is one little piece. It's just a removal of the symptom. That was told to me, and I didn't like, I didn't like those words. I thought if I'm not drinking, I'm a winner. Liar. I can be more dangerous sober than drunk. When I'm drunk, just put me in the corner because I'm going to pass out in about an hour. When I come to, just have a bottle ready. But when we're sober and we're not well, we can be dangerous. Coming to AA meetings has been my experience. Coming to AA meetings my first six months. Praying, get off, up off my knees and look like a drunk without a drink in me. Going to meetings praying, no steps. I was acting out all the time. Use your imagination. I was acting out all the time. I developed a, a, an eating disorder, binging and purging. I was trying to get away from the dirty feeling I had on the inside, and I was still searching for utopia. And I start to lose my way in Alcoholics Anonymous almost six months to the day. I almost got drunk. And only because God intervened once again because he had other plans for me. The mind will feed me despair. And when I'm in a place of despair, it's an extreme form of me. It's an extreme form of self. And despair, what happens with that, my pride and ego will refuse to ask you for help. It loves it. 
So when I'm feeling I've lost my way, I'm, I'm, dis, I'm in despair, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm full of me, and I'm of no use to anyone, and the pride and ego will step in the way and say, do not ask for help, just stay where you are. And some of us even enjoy that kind of thing. I've got some drama going on. Some of us will, will ask for help. And we start to walk through the steps. This has been my experience, going through the steps. And somewhere in there, that self-pity, that despair started to drift away. And what I felt was a purpose and why God got me sober. A purpose in AA, a purpose in my life, some direction in my life. And little by slowly turned back to the same power that I cursed. I started to lose the idea of I need things to keep me happy. A man is rich not by the things he can buy, but by the things he can live without. And through adversity, we will learn to live without things that we thought we needed. And as I start to wake up little by slowly, I start to see how all my needs are really wants dressed up. I don't need anything. I found I don't need anything on a spirit in a spiritual life. I don't need anything on a spiritual life. Everything I need, God gave me the day I was born. Everything. And what I've done over the years was accumulate stuff that my mind and ego says we need to have, that people says you need to have. You need to have a bigger car. You need to have two big cars. You need to have a wife and a girlfriend. You need to have more money. Why are you guys laughing? That resonated with everybody. Yeah. Three guys just walked out. <laughs> I need, I want, I got to have. Why? Because it gives me a sense of me. And all of those things, I'm worshipping my idols now. I'm worshipping my money. I'm worshipping my cause. My, my self-worth is put in a, maybe a two-ton thing called a vehicle. That's me. It's full of holes. It's full of deceit. It's full of uncertainty. I don't need anything. And I speak from my own experience. I like nice things. I like nice clothes. I like to live in a nice place. I like to have money in my pocket because I know what it's like to be homeless and panhandling. But I don't. my life doesn't depend on that stuff anymore. And there was a time that it did. It was a time in early sobriety. I would see the guys, the old timers, driving up in a brand new Cadillac. I see what sobriety does. I can get a Cadillac one day. Let me work harder at sobriety. I was so delusional. Everything I need, we need, God gave us at birth to walk this path. He doesn't require much. My particular God didn't have a car and a cell phone. He wore a robe and sandals, and they're pretty good. And he walked. He didn't say, can you give me a lift to Bethlehem? I'm late. Can you? Right? Everything I need, I've been given by a loving God. And we're here on grace. And we experience grace out there that brings us in here. But there's a big difference between knowing I have God's grace and experience that power that gives me grace. Alcoholics Anonymous, I found from my own experience, yeah, we're going to get an education. We're going to learn stuff. You sit with the sponsor, go through this book, you're going to acquire knowledge, but knowledge is not the answer. Getting an education in Alcoholics Anonymous will not keep me sober. It's the transformation that we get to experience in Alcoholics Anonymous where the big book becomes internalized, where I be the book. I am a reflection of the information in the book because of the transformation. That can't happen by just going to an AA meeting. That can't happen by just doing a little step work here and there. That can't happen by doing one, two, and three, even four and five. Mark talked about it, not completing amends. This comes by a surrender to God, being all in with this book, and letting God in the book take me where it's going to take me, and nothing less than that. The great fact on page 25 is the goal, the spiritual transformation. Page 52 is the complete opposite of that. I have problems in personal relationships. I'm full of fear, feeling of uselessness. Pray to misery and depression. I have no idea what the next minute's going to look like. I get up at 6 o'clock. I get dressed. Uh, I break my shoelace. And I go, see, it's going to be one of these days. Right? Maybe I spilled the coffee. You see what I mean? And the whole day's ruined. Because I broke a shoelace or so spilled the coffee. That's it. Day's over. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. There's traffic. Oh, you see, they're all, they're all after me. 
I mean, this is how we live. And then we walk into the evening. We say, Joe, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm Moses tonight. Everything is good. No, you're not. I'm dis- full of disease, discomfort, irritability, full of fear. I'm full of me. I'm full of a few other things, too. But I'm not free. I'm still experiencing bondage to self. So when our book says in chapter 2, Gnostic, is God going to be everything or else he is nothing? That wasn't just a nice little statement they put in there to provoke a thought. They were dead serious. Is God going to be everything? Because if he isn't, he's nothing. And if God is in everything, I am truly nothing. I'm a drunk in AA without a drink in me, behaving like a drunk without a drink in me. I am not a power of a tr- I'm not a, 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 a power of example. I'm a horror of example. There's an angle on everything. And the worst part is when I go home and put my head on the pillow, I don't sleep. I toss and turn, and I'm listening to the chatter of a thousand voices. Last week I talked about that image that we present for other people and we got the image to, that we present to the voice in the head that no matter what we do, we're not right. Do you ever go buy a, maybe a new outfit? You spend a lot of money and you put it on, you look in the mirror and it says it looks good and the voice says, you only have one outfit. You should have a whole rack. You put on a new outfit and you think it looks pretty good and the voice says, you're still heavy, you're still too thin. When are you going to get to the gym? You got gray hair and it just doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It's relentless. And what we do to this voice, this illness, this mind, is always give it a leg up. We listen to it. We argue with it. We debate with it. We agree with it. And it gets juice. We put steroids into our mind. Anyone ever tells me they don't believe in God, I say, oh, yes, you do. You've been listening to and worshiping your mind for the longest time. That is your God. That is your Buddha, your Allah, your Jesus. The mind. And the quicker I got at a gut level, my mind is my predator. My mind is my enemy. My mind is my Satan, my demons. Eyeball to eyeball that I start to walk away. And then when we start to walk away, the only way we can do that is through spiritual fitness. We get entertained. We have a sitcom 24-7 going on ahead. Just watch some of the stuff that the mind presents to you. It's a riot. And the only difference is because we can't control what thoughts are coming in. The difference between then and now is when the thoughts come in, I say, okay, thanks for sharing. Have a nice day. And I keep moving. Or I'll speak to someone. You've got to see what's going on. i got some fear going on. Let me share this with you. Or I'll write some inventory. Okay, God, here it goes. It's coming in waves. Keep me safe and protected. Let me put on the armor, your armor, to keep me away from this. Because lack of power is my dilemma. With power, no dilemma. Something about experiencing some humility. I've watched people do this. It seems like these humble folks expect nothing and gain the world. And the folks who are always about them, the greedy man and woman, the one who wants, tries to go for everything, and at the end of the day has nothing. They gain the world and lose the soul. And the spiritual path is about feeding the soul, getting my soul food through acts of kindness. Our book says we must act the good Samaritan every day. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. And keep it quiet when you do. You know how we are. I'll go feed the homeless and share about it at every meeting I go to. (laughs) Just be still. He knows, she knows, it knows, whatever you want to call your God. They know what's going on. In fact, who gave me the idea to go feed the homeless? Me? No. And all the good things that come to me, give credit to my creator. And all the screw-ups, I will take the hit for, because that's me in action. And when we fall short, when I would fall short, when I fall short now, all I'm doing is looking at my brokenness. And how I would really operate out there without this power. Constantly screwing up. Constantly in fear. Always having to say I'm sorry because I insist on running the show. It's my own brokenness. Our book says we will outgrow fear based on my relationship with God. So my book promises me that I'll outgrow fear. My question is this. Why am I sitting in an AA meeting still gripped in fear? And fear is always pointing to the future. Fear is never now. Fear is never in the past. It's always when this happens, a minute from now, an hour from now, a year from now. Why do I I sit in fear in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous 
when I have God and 12 steps in the big book. Right? Get to a place where we start to knowing that we're known by our creator. And when that transition happens, fear might show up, but I don't have to open up the door and let him in. Fear shows up, okay, God, walk me through this. And I take God's hand and I go. And I remember, I walk with my creator. The breath going through me is my God breathing through me. The breath going through you is your God breathing through you. Now, the ego doesn't want to hear this. It's uh, The ego says, oh, come on, that's a little out there. No, it is not. Because I didn't plug into a 9-volt battery this morning, get a heartbeat, and start breathing. And some of the things that happened to us on this path, which we really can't explain adequately with words, we don't even know how to begin to explain some of the God stories that we have, but they make absolutely no sense, like God does, to a thinking mind. It frustrates the mind, it frustrates the ego, but we know it happens. And experientially, can we talk about what it's like living in the sunlight of the Spirit as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? Or is that something we haven't gotten there yet? If we're sober 90 days, how come? If we're sober 60 days, how come? You read our history, these guys would get lit up in a week. But we hang around Alcoholics Anonymous and we work on this thing called 90 meetings in 90 days. Don't get me started. When we have the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a guaranteed route from me to get to God. And then I find out there was no proximity between me and God anyway. There is no proximity between us and God. The mind creates a distance. The mind creates proximity. It's closer to me than my own breath. All I need to do is get things out of the way. The process of recovery is removal, never addition. It's subtraction, never addition. The more I lose, the more God I have. The more I get, the less God I got. And if I'm full of me, I'm worshiping me and not God. So we look at the 12 steps on the front end. And if we knew, I did the same thing. It's about the drink. Got to get away from the drink. And that's good. That's a catalyst to move me through. But what about those of us who've been around here a little while? We would, like I said, it's always about the drink. But we got some life situations. We got stuff going on. And the deeper we go, we uncover more. We have financial insecurity, relationship insecurity, me insecurity, everything. You read the headlines now, any minute you're waiting for the world to just to go boom. Everyone hates each other. Everyone's killing each other. I'm right. You're right. He's wrong. I mean, it's bizarre. How do I navigate through this? Ah, simple. It's a narrow road and a very narrow gate that I have to walk. Most people, even in AA, and allow me just kind of soapbox here, are going to walk along a really wide road and pass through a really wide gate because it's simple. It's easy. I have instant gratification and the hangover the next day, and I'll just get back on a horse and do it again because I'm full of disease and discomfort. And this path says, let go of everything and walk a very narrow road to a very narrow gate if you really want to experience your hope you're here and now. I'm guaranteed it when I move from here. But what about now? How am I going to navigate now? And the only one who's going to give me that ability is my God, which is Alcoholics Anonymous in a nutshell, about taking people like us, the broken toys, the lost children, back to God, where we can never do the ordinary things, but we somehow accomplish extraordinary things. My life makes absolutely no sense. What I do for a living, my position at my job, the money I make, the friends that are around me, that invited they just came into my life. I didn't try to buddy up to no one. My friend Art just showed up. That's a whole God story. He's so close to me. He's like a brother to me. It makes no sense. That I even, we enjoy being around each other. How we met is a whole God story. But he was awake enough, I was awake enough to see the invitation. Living along the line of God's will transcends what I normally do. And the mind is not my God anymore. And life problems are just situations. My mind can't see down the road. God can. How often have we had something happen to us? It's happened to me. We go, oh no, I don't like this. And we get upset and we'll cry about it. <clears throat> Fast forward six months and we see the lesson learned in that. Or we do this. I've done this a million times. It's a good thing it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. 
because it's pretty cool right now. Maybe four years ago, I was working for a place down in Texas. 70, 80 hour weeks. Seven days a week. Pretty much built the place from the inside. Filled the place just on my name. They didn't get one referral other than my name. 40 beds, 30 with my name. Referrals by me. Developed the curriculum, did everything. Working nonstop. I was living the dream. I was doing what I love to do for a living and getting paid for it. Well, greed and other agendas got in the owner's way, and they got rid of me like I was a bad habit. Just kicked me out the door. And I remember sitting in, uh, down by the Jersey Shore, sitting outside of a little diner on a, like a park bench. And uh, I remember sitting there going, I'm back on a park bench. And I'm weeping, and people are walking by saying, what's wrong with this guy? My tears are rolling down my cheeks because I don't know what I'm going to do. Who's going to hire me at my age to do what I do? Where am I going to get a job? And I says, you've left me again. I can't make this pass because I can't, I can't do this. This is way too painful. I have huge financial insecurity, jobs insecure. I don't know where I'm going. And I was upset. And I got upset with God. And I tried to bargain with God. And I called my sponsor. And we did some step work, and I remembered my life was none of my business, and it was letting go once again. He was one of my many, any lens. Are you going to trust me or not? Are you going to let go or still try to steer with one hand? You need to let go. And that was scary as hell. And that's where I learned when we say in AA, the leap of faith, there is no such thing as a leap of faith. Leap of faith because I'm scared to death that I'm going to fall. That's why it feels like a leap of faith. God's given me the, 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 the elements to move, the catalyst in me to move. He's in the middle of the walk and he's on the other side. There is no leap of faith. It's just a change. Am I going to trust God? So I'm out of work. I have a little bit of money saved, but that's running out quick. What do I do? About two months later, I get a call from my friend Art. How about coming down to Florida and do what you do? And it seemed like overnight we put the key in the door, and now I live in Florida. And God knew for the longest time I've been looking to move to Florida since I'm a kid. I love Florida. I love the beach. I love the warm weather. I just, it's pretty. I couldn't deal with the Northeast anymore. It's kind of, I'm from the Northeast. How you doing? Why? You writing a book? What do you want to know? You know? I just said hello. Marion came to Jersey with me for the first time, right? She said, I'm going downstairs and to the lobby. She said, why? She said, I want to hear New Jersey people talk. <laughs> so fast forward, and here I am working where I love to work, living where I love to live. My point is, we can't see the future. Are we going to trust God or not? And now that it's all said and done, I realize that the, the shutting of the doors for me in Texas was God's blessing. It was a great thing. How much longer at my age can I work 60, 70, 80 hours a week? I would have died on the job, and I was not happy after a while living in this little one-horse town in Texas with drug cartels all over the place. God says, enough. Put you in Florida. And I look back, he says, I'm glad I made that decision to move to Florida. <laughs> still spilling my drinks. Okay. So step three says we made a decision to turn our will and life over to care of God as we understood him. As we heard many times in meetings, it's just a decision. It doesn't mean I've done anything. A decision means like, hey, I want to get in shape. I want to go to the gym. And I never get off the couch. I haven't done anything. I need to get off the couch, go to the gym, and then I get, you know, pay a million dollars for some membership. I hire a trainer. I get all the right clothes. I get the big bottle of water. You know those guys walk around, the, the water bottle guys? I, I spend a lot of time in the mirror. I buy two shirt, T-shirts that are three sizes too small, right? And I walk around the gym. And if you're anything like me, I look for an ashtray on the treadmill. I mean, if, you know. if I haven't done anything, what do I need to do is go break a sweat. And little by slowly, I start to see results. 
In vision for you, it says patience, willingness, and labor. Labor is work. So decision in three is just a decision to get to that power to experience permanent sobriety. And there's some conditions and considerations in our third step. Leading up to it, it says this. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. The path of step three into four through nine. Fail at what? Sobriety and God consciousness. Rarely. Now, the myth is that Bill wanted to change that word to never. That's not true. Bill didn't want to say never because that would set us up for a lot of controversy. Because people do fail. People do get drunk. It says those who do not recover our people cannot or will not completely give themselves to a simple program. Am I in a place of completely giving myself to this completely? It means completely. It means completely. What they're doing is setting me up to take step three, to turn my, my, my thinking and my actions over to a God that I don't even know yet. What an order. On page 60, it says, we were alcoholic and cannot manage our own life. My sponsor showed me how to read it this way. Drunk or sober, I'm alcoholic and cannot manage my own life. Drunk or sober, that probably no human power could relieve me of my alcoholism. Drunk or sober. And God could and would if he was sought. What am I doing to experience this power? Simple things like going to an AA meeting and denying God because it's not popular at that meeting. Or become a religious zealot or big book guy or a big book thumper or worse words or he's a religious fanatic in an AA meeting. When we study our history, this looked like a Christian movement. They made no bones about it. This is, we're reading right out of scripture, guys. But we will go to AA and not talk about God in a meeting, not even talk about God over a cup of coffee, and then go get our knees and surrender to the God we just denied. There's something wrong with this relationship. It's like being married to someone but embarrassed to introduce them to someone. That marriage is in trouble. That makes sense? What we ought to be in AA is a pep rally for the power of God and shouting God from the rooftops. Because when it hits the fan, I'm going right to him anyway, so let me tell you about it, what it's done for me. Let me bear witness for you, which is part of what we do in step three. My Lord. Am I convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success? And all I have to do is look at my life in the past, experientially, based on what, have I, what I've been doing. Has my life been successful? No. So I showed up to my sponsor. He had me write out the third step prayer word for word and write out my interpretation of what the third step prayer was saying. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me, to do with me as you want. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties. Victory over them. Bear witness to you. Let me be living proof for others that this power works. Am I willing to do this? When I wrote it out in my language, it made some sense. And we held hands, got on our knees and did the third step prayer and immediately went into step four. Growth doesn't occur until I step into the unknown, which is step three, which is four through nine. Real spiritual growth doesn't occur until I step into the unknown. Regardless if I'm doing the work the first time or the 20th time. It's new territory. I'm going from what I know to a place I don't know. I need to be willing to go to any lengths, the many, any lengths. I ask guys, are you willing to go to any lengths? And they go, ah, oh, that means no. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you mean by any lengths? So your ego and mine is still kind of shaping this path. I can't do that. And my question is always this, as it was asked to me, based on your life and you running the show, how's that been working for you so far? Anytime you start to drive, how's that working out for you? Anytime you make a decision to do something on your own, how's that working out for you? The quality of my life at this moment depends upon my relationship with God. The amount of presence I have at this moment depends upon my relationship with God. The breath I take depends upon God. And me staying away from a drink or any other non-conference approved dry goods depends upon my relationship with God. Because on my own, I'm in serious trouble. That's my brokenness. And I never, ever want to serve my mind again. It'll serve me. And I will always serve God. That's how I got here tonight. I'm out of time. Thank you. 
My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober. Uh, guys, hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Grateful to be alive and sober and uh, get to share the next few weeks about this message and this book and what my God has done for me. And um, if uh, we continue to seek what he'll continue to do for us. Um, something I wanted to share, I was sharing with some folks this afternoon before we get going. Um, Dr. Harry Tebow wrote some stuff about reemergence of ego uh, a whole bunch of years ago. And I shared it with some new folks today. Hopefully it resonated. Uh, it certainly resonates with me and those of us who've been around a while. Uh, there's some readings by Thomas Merton, uh, some writings by Thomas Merton. Um, when we see, uh, you can see his influence here um, in uh, reemergence of ego and the separation from God. And uh, he writes the following. Um, the so-called typical alcoholic is a narcissistic, egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence intent on maintaining at all costs its integrity. Inwardly, the alcoholic brooks no control for man or God. He, the alcoholic, is and must be master of his destiny. He will fight to the end to preserve that position. If the alcoholic can truly accept the presence of a power greater than himself, which is step two consideration, he by that very step modifies, at least temporarily and possibly permanently, his deepest inner structure. And when he does so without resentment or struggle, then he is no longer typically alcoholic. And the strange thing is that if the alcoholic can sustain that inner feeling of acceptance, he can and will remain sober for the rest of his life, which challenges and flies right in the face of hanging in there doing a day at a time. He goes on to say, a religious or spiritual awakening is the act of giving up one's reliance on one's own omnipotence. The defined individuality no longer defies but accepts help, guidance, and control from the outside. And as the individual relinquishes his negative, aggressive feelings towards himself and towards life, he finds himself overwhelmed by strongly positive ones such as love, friendliness, peacefulness, and pervading contentment, which state is the exact and tip the opposite of the former relentless, restless irritability, which is kind of like what the great fact is talking about. He says they must lose the narcissistic element permanently, otherwise the program of AA works only temporarily. Regardless of his final conception of that power, unless the individual attains in the course of a time a sense of, of the reality and nearness of a uh, power greater than themselves, his egocentric nature will reassert itself with undiminished intensity, and drinking will again enter into the picture. Um, what a warning. What it's telling me is I will experience this reemergence of ego, and the ego will never tell me it's reemerging. And what happens to someone like me as I start to drift away from the solution, and I will defend myself to the end. You're wrong, and I'm right. All of you are wrong, and I'm right. I will defend inappropriate behavior and make it very appropriate. I will defend unspiritual behavior and make it spiritual. And it will slowly drift away from God. And who has become God is me. How can I meet God? How can I experience God if I am now God? Now, my ego tells me I'm praying and worshiping God. I'm meditating. I'm doing all the spiritual disciplines. But what I am doing when I'm praying is worshiping me. And my ego is, being talk, is talking to me. And my sponsor becomes an obstacle, and the any lens he tells me to do becomes in the way. And suddenly things get busy. Things get in the way of me experiencing God. So what I have found that the only thing I can do is when I bottom out in this place is once again a surrender like I always do. Most of us need to do is a complete surrender and continually rework in the first nine steps to clear self out and experience the sunlight of the spirit, the less self, more God. Well, one thing I was made clear on a long time ago, when I pray and I surrender and I beg, I cannot command the Spirit to do what I want. You'll see some of these athletes, they make the sign of the cross before they get up there, like God's going to grant them a grand slam home run. <laughs> and even us, when we pray, we will pray to have God go along with our plans of what we're secretly doing. God, give me this so I can do that. God just doesn't operate that way. He'll give an abundance if it's along his will. And my job in the praying is uh, 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 showing a willingness to be aligned with his will. That's what, that's what the prayer is really all about. 
We have wonderful words and different prayers. We're not commanding the spirit to, to convey a thought of my willingness, my readiness to be changed and do whatever God has for me. And it really, that's why it's what we're doing, not what we're saying that counts. I want to do any lens. And my sponsor says, take a white chip. And I say, I'm not doing it. My sponsor says, make 90 meetings in 90 days. I'm not doing it. My sponsor says, go to that meeting. I don't want to go because there are conditions on this. Well, what happened to my prayer? So really what I'm doing, I'm mouthing any lens, but my actions are my lens, not what the sponsor tells me. And what I have found out is when we say we concede to our innermost self, I did it. In different words, June 23rd, 1988, my last separation from alcohol, I conceded to my innermost self. What was different about that concession compared to my fifth treatment center uh, concession when I used two days after treatment? Is that 1988, it was followed up with actions purely out of desperation. I mean, I couldn't tie my own shoelaces without seeking counsel because I didn't know how to do it. I just took direction. It was really out of just desperation, nothing else. I wasn't looking to be a talker in AA or even make coffee. I wasn't even thinking about AA in 1988. I don't want to die as the plea. I made a plea, and then I took some action. And that action was, I was being pushed to take that action because I couldn't deny what God had for me. There's something that goes, uh, that this body that is sown uh, uh, in dishonor gets glory. And it's only through God. We get to experience the glory of God in our false times only by pursuing, only by seeking. And I tell newcomers all the time when they tell me, well, that's a little extreme for any lens. I don't know if I want to go to any lens. And they give you lots of excuses, which means they still want to use. And my question to them is, did you go, like I did, any lens to get drunk, any lens to get high? I would go anywhere, do anything for the price of a drink or some powder, right? And we come into A and they say, pray twice a day. Well, that's a little extreme. <laughs> You know, my sponsor says I have to stop my fourth step. I think I'm going to get another sponsor. What, what I get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, even to the many, any lengths that God has put in front of me to pick up my cross and go, is I kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to the work I had to do to keep drunk. When the reemergence of ego happens, I start to go backwards the same way I went forwards through the steps. So a book says we concede to our innermost self. It's the first step. Not literally the first step as written, but the first step towards getting well. It's my concession, my surrender that I know at a gut level, and that's a spiritual thing when that happens. It's not an exercise in intellect. At a gut level, no one has to tell me. It's, a, it's a, an experience in here where I realize I am in serious trouble. I can't stop drinking. I am alcoholic, and I need help. And even with that concession, all it does when I say please help, it places me in a position to be changed. Am I willing to, to go to any lengths to do that? When our book says in chapter two, agnostics, uh, God is everything or nothing, they really mean everything. Because if he's not everything, then he really is nothing. And on both considerations, what I did was, was an exercise in intellect. Yeah, God's everything. But he really wasn't, because my action didn't show it. And it's a setup for what we're going to see in step three. When we make a decision, I made a decision to turn everything over to God, my thinking and my life, my actions. It's an uncomfortable uh, experience for the ego when ego finds out that the life is none of its business anymore. And before the spiritual transformation has ha happens, many of us who don't want to admit it, we are our ego. We're walking, and there's a spirit in there. The person in the crack house right now, the person drinking booze on the bridge right now, has just as much God in them as the Pope in Rome, but there's no relationship. But prior to the spiritual experience, I was my ego. And if I'm not careful, I will still be my ego. I will still be my pride. I will still be self-centered and self-seeking. Even when I'm pouring my heart out to you, it's all about me. What can I get out of this? It's always about me. So we are our ego prior to uh, the spiritual transformation, including making meetings. Here's a good way to look at how my egos uh, are flaring up. Do I have to shake hands and say hello to every single person at meeting? Or can I just sit down and be stuck? Or if I don't say hello, they won't like me. They think I'm not going to go and say hello. I guess say hello, I guess say hello, I guess say hello, and they say hello to them. You don't like you, I'm going to still say hello to you because I want everyone to go, wow, you're a great guy. 
What a spiritual giant. He said hello to everybody. And I go out with me and my ego into the car and go home. And then I put my head on the pillow and something's really wrong. Because I haven't done anything to get my soul food. That's why the meetings don't keep us sober. It's a fellowship. It's a band-aid on an open wound. So when our book says conceit, when our book asks me, conceit to my innermost self. Is God everything or nothing? What was my choice to be? They really meant this literally. It wasn't just a nice group of words that, that Bill put together. And then for those of us who've been around here a little while, a couple of years or double digits, what's that currently look like? What does that third step currently look like? Has my ego reemerged? Well, the newcomers need to go through the steps. I went through the steps 20 years ago, and God damn it, I'm spiritual. And I never <laughs> How am I doing? How, te- how teachable am I? After five or ten years in Alcoholics Anonymous. How teachable am I when I hear someone say something that I never heard before and it sounds a little radical? How teachable am I when the sponsor sits me down and says, we're going to try the steps a different way out of the big book. Just to trick the ego. How teachable when I go into a big book meeting and the the speaker just talks about um, everything but the big book. Do I shut him or her down in my head? I'm not listening to this. That's all ego. How, how am I telling you how you have to believe in you, how you have to believe in how you must go through the steps because I think it's the only way to go. It's all ego. And the neat thing about one of the, the byproducts of experiencing this power is a spirit of ease and comfort with everything. It doesn't mean I'm going to roll over. I will, me personally, I will challenge till the cows come home. And I get really excited about this. But coming from a place of ease and comfort is different than some folks who have this big book and become very, very angry at AA because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's all ego, which has to be dismantled and grinded into dust at some point during this process. And by me just attending meetings, it's not going to work. I'll get a quick fix for now and I'll feel really good. But what happens when I go home? Because that's really where it counts, not in an AA meeting. How am I doing when I'm out there? on a line in Publix, on 95 in traffic, tending to my children, spending time with my loved ones. How am I really doing then? Am I rigorously honest in all my affairs? Am I a man of my word? Or do I cut corners and lie? So the way I went through the steps, I can quickly go backwards through the steps as the ego starts to reemerge. I will endorse all of that. I'll start the steps next week. I'm going to go to this big book. I'll start the steps next week. I never left a little bit of a, a liquor in a drink in a, in a glass till next week. <laughs> right? You drink now. Forget about tomorrow. We're drinking now. Drink it all now. We'll go out and steal to get money to continue drinking. But right now we are drinking. And what we tend to do, some of us do, in AAs, I will get it tomorrow. I'll start now. I'll finish next week. I got, I'm going on vacation. I'll finish my fourth step when I get back. I'm going to hear these things. It's bizarre. And then we die. So I, you know, concede to my innermost self. I take a look at my powerlessness, my lack of power, choice, control, my unmanageability with the drink, and my current unmanageability, sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if the real unmanageability is not having an idea what the day is going to look like when the drink says go drink, and I go drink, and I can't stop it. And I won't even have the ability to run to my home group to say, I want a drink, please help me because I'll probably get drunk on the way to my home group. That's how I drink. No human power could relieve me of my alcoholism. That's not only the drink, it's alcoholism, the stuff that accompanies alcoholism. My self is self-centered, self-seeking ways, my pride and my ego, all of it. Because we know just removing the drink doesn't mean I'm much better. When I got into AA in 1988, after 90 days, I was not sponsorship material. I was still sick untreated alcoholic. How I got here tonight is truly a miracle. I should have been drunk 50 times already in early recovery. But it was grace. And there was a reason why he kept me sober so I can do what I do now, I guess. But I found there's a big difference between having God's grace, which we're just given, and experience that power, which gives me grace. Big difference. And I can only get that by clearing out self in one through nine. Well, what lengths am I willing to go to? Step one told me I'm drinking and there's no way out. I will drink. At some point, I will drink. I, I, I have new kids in front of me all day long at work. 
And I, I totally get it. You're in your 20s. There's nothing stopping you in your 20s. Not an old guy like me saying, get spiritual at 21. You're looking to rip up the town still. There's a way I might be able to cheat a little bit. And they all get drunk. They all get drunk. Or they all go get high. And some of them die. That's alcoholism. I mean, it's possible, and me included, that some of us in this room might die of alcoholism. There's no guarantee because I'm coming to Monday night, 12-step, that I'm going to be sober tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow. This is it right now. My sponsors always tell me, Peter, what are you doing about the dash? I had no idea what he meant. What are you doing about the dash? I said, Mark, what does that mean? He said, when you go to a cemetery and there's a headstone, the plot, there's a day God brought you here and gave the day God takes you home, right in the middle, is a two-inch dash. What are you doing about the dash? Because that's all you got. But life is a vapor. Gone, here and gone. And we spend years getting drunk, trying to control and regulate. We spend years in resentments. We spend years in defects of character. We spend years bouncing in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the most means, you got the 12 and 12. The medicine is there, but we don't eat. God prepares a banquet for every meeting I go into, and many of us go home hungry. As long as we're shaking hands and running for some sort of office in here, we're good. The truth will find me every time. I don't have to find the truth. The truth will find me. I'm an alcoholic. The guy on page 21, I will drink. And it won't be a day where it, it necessarily where it looks like a really bad day. It could, I'll win Powerball, and the thought will say, now we can really drink. We don't need God anymore. i got just enough money not to need God. But I will drink. So what am I doing while I'm in here? To stay away, not only from the first drink, but to experience this power called God. Because when we're in that place, what we do get to experience a day at a time is permanent sobriety which means everyone in this room will never drink again, never drug again. Everyone in this room, whether you got one day or a whole bunch of years, everyone in this room is guaranteed permanent sobriety. And when I say sobriety, we're talking about life that's joyous, happy, and free. Everyone in this room. Now, life is problematic. Things come at us. People die. People go away. Relationships break up. Money comes. Money goes. That's just the, the way life works. But how we navigate, how I navigate through that is in a place of being joyous, happy, and free. I'll get disturbed, I'll weep, I'll get angry and keep moving. I'm not just caught up in that. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. All hinging on my relationship with God. So what's our relationship with God look like tonight? How's that looking? Am I practicing fidelity to God? Or do I have other things? Am I cheating on God? Do I have other lovers? My money, my car, my relationship, all important very important relationships. Our loved ones are extremely important. God gave them to us. But I can't have them unless I have God. Because when I lose God, I lose that. So that relationship, that loved one that you worship, you adore, wonderful. Have a great life. Without God, you will lose it. And then I will drink and die. So step two is this consideration about this power is going to take me to a place of wholeness of mind. An interesting thing about this place of wholeness of mind is that my mind means I have this new, this new mind, this God mind, this renewal of this mind, the, the metanoia, the purging out of the old and embracing what was there at the beginning, this golden nugget that's way on the bottom of the haystack, which God gave us at birth. It's just been, I've accumulated things. I've accumulated belief systems and fears and anger and conceptions and perceptions about everything. I can't find my own way out. And what the steps do is clear off the path. Am I willing to go to this power to restore me to wholeness of mind? First, I'm not thinking about drinking. The obsession will go away, and even the thought about drinking will be removed. We're talking about God here. We're not talking about a human power that will kind of fix us up a little bit. We're talking about the boss. And when I get aligned with that power, there's no time for me or you to be thinking about drinking. Watch a beer commercial. Yeah, I used to drink that. You keep changing the channel. It's not like you want to dive head first into the TV. <laughs> we're doing a 12-step call. Yeah, I used to drink the same stuff while we're pouring it down the sink. We're not jumping into the drain. I remember I was into this work. Uh, newly sober, had some knee surgery, and um, my knee was really banged up. I had crutches, and they gave me uh, pain meds. And I called my sponsors. You need to take them. 
And I took them for three days, and I never forget this. I got the rest and flushed it down the toilet, and I couldn't believe I was watching them go down the toilet. <laughs> but there was no, oh my God, I'm really doing it. I didn't have it. I didn't save any just in case medicine. <laughs> you know, just in- the old just in case medicine. I didn't do that. And I was so happy. I mean, I remember going to an afternoon meeting and said, I don't believe what I just did. Not like I don't believe what I just did. I, I don't believe what I just did. This is so cool. It's called freedom. Wholeness of mind. The demons that I faced for so long, fear, insecurity, doubt, skepticism, hate, resentment, jealousy, the lust, the greed, all of that stuff that just had me like an anchor around my neck. Like the book says, drop the rock, I just enough. But I didn't will that. That dropping of the rock, that enough came from a place of desperation once more. It was a surrender. I'll do anything to be free of this. And there was some action I had to take. And then one day I wake up and I'm saying, these demons aren't on me anymore. A day at a time. Because I'm not cured of alcoholism. What I have is a daily reprieve. And that hinges on my relationship with God. And step three was my decision. Page 62 talks about selfishness, self-centered is the root of my troubles. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. I will die from, from a, 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 a thousand cuts, never one shot. I will die from a thousand cuts. No inventory, don't call the sponsor, cut back on meetings, cut back on sponsoring people. A little dishonesty here, a little dishonesty there, a little bit more dishonesty there. Mismanage my money, um, not, so, not practicing real fidelity in my relationship. And it goes on and on and on. I, I just bleed out. And I went, how did this, how did I get drunk? I've been going to meetings. We die from a thousand cuts. Am I willing, when my sponsor says, am I willing to go to any lengths? Any lengths is any lengths, and it's not on my terms. That was made clear to me back in 1988, 89 with my teachers. Your life is none of your business. I didn't even get to the third step yet. And every time I did the third step, holding hands on my knees, every one of my sponsors says, your life is none of your business. I understood it the fifth and ten times through the work. The first time it seemed like what a radical proposal, but it had to be better than the way I was living because how I lived was awful, drunk or sober. Drunk or sober, an alcoholic cannot manage my own life, and no human power is going to relieve me of this alcoholism. Drunk or sober. The ego wants to tell me, well, you go to meetings, you speak a little bit. You have to still write inventory. Do you know how many folks I speak to with double digits when they hear me writing inventory? They say, you still write inventory? (laughs) Well, excuse me for breathing. I'm sorry. (laughs) So I make a decision in three to get there. And the bottom of page 62 talks about this is the how and why of it. We had to quit playing God. Had to quit playing God. Why? It doesn't work. And I got to see, as I start step four, how I have been playing God in every area of my life, my entire life. Expectations, secretly demanding that people do what I want. The relationships, she better do this. She better say, I love you on cue, in a certain inflection too. (laughs) I never forget sponsoring uh, this this young fellow. And he came to a home group. I was living in Staten Island. And he, he looked like... He was dying. I said, what happened? He was in this relationship the week before. He was joyous, happy, and free because he met Mrs. Wright. And everything was cool. So what happened? And he, he was sharing some intimate details. And, uh, well, we didn't make love last night. She's leaving me. As you made love to her six nights in a row, the poor girl's tired. What's the problem? <laughs> what the problem is because it's all about me. And you're not doing exactly what I want on cue. This is how I operate. This is how this young fellow is operating. We play God in every... We even ass- I assign God role, a role to play. God loves me, so I'm going to hit the power ball. He loves you, but Luke loves me a little bit more, so when I get my ticket in there, he's going to give me power. Then I get pissed off when I don't hit. Right? We assign God a role. We assign people a role. We assign everyone a role, and I have a role to play as well. And I'm always in collision with everyone. The interesting thing it talks about on page 62, I go from all about me and all my self-reliance instead of God-reliance, all my self-centeredness instead of God-centeredness, go to page 63. We didn't get to step four yet. And they talk about the transition, the transformation that's going to happen to us 
at some point or immediately upon a third step is that I will be less and less thinking about me and more and more thinking about you and what I can contribute to life. How I can serve God better. In one page, it's a third step promise. It is the third step. And what I was able to do, what we're able to do, is recite this third step prayer with the sponsor, hopefully. And if we miss a few words, it's okay. Because what I have found out, it's the intent at which I hit that prayer with. And again, I'm not commanding the spirit, but I'm showing my willingness and, and displaying my willingness to be changed right now. I stand ready. And if it means I'm going to work in the Salvation Army for just a few bucks a year, and that's going to be my life, if I'm right with God, it'll be paradise. No conditions on this. This is God's deal. Now, the first time I went through the work, I didn't, I, I didn't get all of that. But I kept chopping wood and carrying wood. I get it now. In fact, I get it more now, sober a few years, than I did at the beginning. And the more dependence, the more reliance I need upon this power called God. And I think my actions, for the most part, show that. I'm seeking. I'm serving. I'm serving and I'm seeking. And very often, uh, it's not about me. I'm not perfect. Sometimes it is about me. But very often, it is not. And that's why my life's pretty much an open book. You walk with me. You tell me. I have no problem with people walking with me to see how I walk this walk. And that's not being boastful. That's just, if I didn't say that, it would be false humility, huh? So the third step was about me turning everything over to God, and I don't stay there. And sometimes I hear folks say, work a really good third step, hang out in the third step, get a good third step, read the third step every day. If that's what floats your boat, that's great. It's not what the big book says. It is not what the big book says. It's not what I say, what the big book says is, next, we launch out on the course of vigorous action. So I do a third step prayer with you now, and in five minutes, you're starting your fourth step. Unless you have a notepad and pen, you're going to start immediately. There is no time to wait, because as I keep turning it over to God, and if I don't, the illness is right behind me looking to pull me back. I'm being pursued. So I better get right with God right away. Because the illness doesn't care how long we're sober. The illness doesn't care I go to lots of meetings. It's looking to pull me in. And what this, this thing will do is throw up roadblocks. It seems like a, a priest once told me, the closer in a sense, because there really is no proximity with God, but the closer I'm getting to God, this thing breathes even louder and screams even more to pull me down. It doesn't want me right with God. It doesn't want me in an AA meeting. It doesn't want me doing this work. So it will create roadblocks all in the mind. And we'll, we'll justify some things as to why I'm not doing step four. Well, I had a long day today. I need to make dinner. I need to watch you know, the Academy Awards. This is important, right? Something. I need to do something other than get my soul food. Now, I was talking to Jimmy and Mary, but I always tell this story uh, about my first fourth step. And um, I was living in this uh, apartment, this little studio apartment. I had come from the gutter, literally in the street, and I had this little studio apartment. And I had what was a bookshelf. Uh, I turned it into a desk because I had nothing. So I used this little bookshelf, my first fourth step, um, as a desk. And I had a little lamp on it. And... Um, I began writing my fourth step. I'm sober 25 years and changed. So this thing is, is old. And I didn't know Jimmy and Maribeth have it in storage. I'm going to have it shipped to my, to my apartment as soon as I can. I thought it was gone to the universe. And so it's very important because I remember forging this out on this notepad on this bookshelf. It's the only thing I really had in the place. I had an old futon on the floor, and that was it, and the telephone. It's really interesting about this the first time I did the fourth step, really out of desperation that I was doing. Because now I was clear, I don't want to go back to drinking anymore. I will do anything. And this is if this is all I own for the rest of my life, I'm okay because I'm not using. And I'm really trying to do right during the day. I'm showing up for work every day. You know, I'm calling my dad regularly rather than him fine, trying to find me. I'm sending letters home to my family that I love them. And just, you know, in the middle of the month, no holiday to do that. And I'm really trying. I'm attending meetings, and I really want to get well. And God gave me the power to do it. 
it's interesting when we're doing God's will, how right we feel with that. And when we're not, how sick we feel and the emotional hangover we get the next day. And there I was, I would sit down with my big book and I have my notepad and pen. There were my instructions. And I remember create, making prayer and creating this master list of names. All the people I was resentful at. His mom, dad, my brothers, my grandparents, friends. I went back to God. The book says we went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. Now, I can't be thorough like that. I can't be honest like that. I can be a little bit honest. I can be a little bit thorough. But we're talking about going all the way in. Here's our third step. There's no amen after the third step prayer because it's a movement. Three, God, take me by the hand. We're going in. And when we're done in seven, we close up with the amen. Now we go out and fix. So God's taken me into this, this into the hood of my life. <laughs> And we all have our stuff. The things that we don't want to see the live day, the things we don't want to remember, the things we just tuck away. If I don't think about it, it won't live. It grows in the dark. And God puts a floodlight on all of it. What I want to, uh, uh, what I'm being moved to say, it's really important, especially if you never did a fourth step. Things will come to the surface that you thought you forgot. Even going through the steps a whole bunch of times. Things will come to the surface that are going to make us uncomfortable. It's not me who's bringing it to the table. It's not you who's bringing it to the table to write. It's God revealing to us what needs to be revealed. We said, God, get me free. Everything is yours. He's okay. Here it is. Here's what's in the way. It totally contradicts what the ego wants, what the self wants. And I got to see how I've been living with the ego. I am the ego. I am this false self, not the self God created. I am this, 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 this puppet. Whatever the ego says, I did. And God's saying, we're going to shut this down now. We need to get free. Because you told me in step three, I'm taking over. And God really thinks you mean it. So I create this master list. And whatever goes on paper, if I'm following directions in this book, and I'm praying to be searching fearless and moral, and I'm giving thanks when the writing is over, and I'm being uh, truthful and surrendering to God with this and doing all the things I'm expected to do, then that fourth step in spirit is a perfect fourth step. I hear too many people say, oh, there's no such thing as a perfect fourth step. So God is imperfect. When did I become bigger than God to even make a statement like that in Alcoholics Anonymous? Your fourth step is perfect. In spirit, there's mistakes. We'll fix it. We'll do another fourth step. But that writing, the intent is pure. That's what God gave me to write. I have to say that this is perfect. And my sponsor will tweak and listen and push and pull. Maybe explore some more. This is complete letting go here. So God will reveal to us in his time. Every time I go through the steps, sometimes things pop up that I didn't even know were there. The ground's fertile enough to God put it. Do some more work with me. The need to continually go through the work. What I have found, I was one of those guys who uh, would go through the steps one time. And I speak for myself with this one. Go through the steps one time and one time only and live in 10, 11, and 12. And around 10 years of sobriety, I start to experience some uh, restlessness, irritability, and discontentment. And I start to be a little AA cop. <laughs> People would talk about the big book, and I'd analyze instead of listening. Reemergence of ego. And a gentleman was up from Texas, and uh, I went to him, and I asked him if he can sponsor me. He said, I've been waiting for you. He said, are you ready to have your whole life turned upside down? And I was still in that place of, it's got to be better than where I am. And I began going through the steps over and over. At least once a year, I go through the steps. I don't, I don't just the way God has disciplined. I've been disciplined to the spiritual life. So 1 through 9 into 10, 11, and 12, but some folks will go through the steps one time and one time only. And if I'm, if I'm defending that, if I'm fighting off people who continually re rework the steps, it's my ego flourishing again. Oh, you don't go through the steps more than once. I don't want to hear about it. Why are you getting so defensive? Because it's become a threat. It's become a threat to my ego. And I spoke to uh, this gentleman named Paul Martin, who's my great grand sponsor. He was sponsored by Dr. Bob. I spoke to him a few years ago. I had a handful of phone calls with him. He was out of uh, Chicago. And I asked him this question about going through the steps over and over again. 
And he said firsthand what happened, because he was one of the guys, one of the first the, the spearheads of going through the work over and over again. He says, but the book doesn't tell us. The stories in the back of those early members, what happened to a lot of us, he said, after about five years of sobriety, we start to visit page 52 a little too often. We were looking for some sedative, some, some medication, because we were nervous. We were full of ang uh, anxiety. We had some fear going on, and we were doing all of this, but there was something going on we couldn't locate. Some went to psychiatrists, and some got drunk, and so on. And uh, truly, by the grace of God, he had one of his uh, uh, guys coming over to hear a fifth step off of him. And he was praying to get ready for this fifth step. And what he said was he had this intuitive thought that he couldn't deny. You know, when God moves you, you get moved. When God speaks, you know it. And he stopped putting some things together on paper. And his idea was what he calls swapping inventory. He was going to hear the prospect's inventory and say, can you listen to mine? That's what he did. So his little sponsee heard his sponsor's fifth step. And the sponsor went, uh, he went home and he was left in his apartment. And he, he took the directions and looked at some stuff in six and seven. And realized through between four, five, six, and seven, he had some outstanding amends he hadn't made. And he had some amends he wasn't even aware of and cleared up some things. By the time he hit 10, 11, and 12, he found this, this newfound freedom. There's something to this. That caught like wildfire. And it just kind of spread around. In certain lineages, you'll see people going through the work regularly. My question is, if you're hearing this now while I'm saying this, and you're thinking, oh, my God, that's horrible. Have you tried it? Do we have contempt prior, to, uh, uh, contempt prior to investigation? Because I did. When I would hear these guys tell me I go to the steps over and over again, I said, what kind of nonsense is that? <laughs> I went through it one time and one time only, and I'm proud of it. And then I bottomed out. So I've been on both sides of the fence, and I like this side a whole lot better. Now, if you're in a place you're going through it one time, your joy is happy and free, go, I'm not here to change that. Let's just challenge a little bit. So I wrote this master list in four, and I had this little bookshelf that was a, turned into a desk, and I make a whole bunch of coffee, because that's what you guys did, made coffee. <laughs> I don't drink it at night, but there it was. And I had a little light, and I sit there, and I come home from my meeting and write. My sponsor says, if you stay home and write, you can not go to a meeting tonight. If you stay home tonight, just watch TV and not write. We have a problem. So I'd stay home a couple of nights a week and write to sit, and I got done right away. I, it was a lot. It was five spiral notebooks when I got done. It was a purging. It just kept pushing and pushing. And one of the things I was told to do was pray before I write. Write a prayer across the page. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be searching fearless and more because I can't do that on my own. And then I write whatever came to the pen went on paper. No censoring, no denying. The pen is now the spiritual translator. huh? It's God working right through me. So I can't play with that. When we studied the, the early members, uh, they talked about uh, the confession of sins and things like that. They wrote a list, too. They took inventory. I forget who said it. It goes something like this. A life without inventory is a life not worth living. How many of us in AA actually do inventory and expect to have a life of abundance? Right. So um, I started writing resentments, and my first column talks about the names and to forget my first inventory I wrote was with mom. And I thought like the skies were going to open up and thunder and lightning was going to happen because it's your mom. How do you write a resentment about mom and my anger, even hate and disappointment that she commits suicide? How could she do this to me? It was still about me. Here's a woman who was sick and suffering, dying of alcoholism. The will to live was taken from her by alcoholism. And I'm thinking, poor me. Self-centered. And so I would write my four columns. Second column talked about cause. Put the name in the first column. Mom. Cause. She was alcoholic. She committed suicide. And that's what we do with the second column. Just an instruction here. It's easy to go from column to column to column rather than writing straight across the pages. Too much shifting. And so that's what I was taught to do. Second column, I put the reason why I'm angry with that person. It came to the third column, which is very interesting because I didn't know this the first time writing. I was just following directions. Third column is explained to me, go for it. 
that their column is really, really seeing how I interpret the world and then how I operate in column four. The seven areas of self, my pride, how I think you view me. No one should see me in a certain, in a compromising position. No one should see me and my spouse argue. No one should see my boss uh, uh, reprimanding. No one should see me falter because you're going to think less of me. If you think less of me, that means you don't like me. If you don't like me, that means I lose your friendship. If I lose your friendship, that means I'm all alone. I'm all alone. I'm abandoned. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. How many of us... It sounds extreme, but how many of us, like, maybe we go to the bank account and you find out your funds are a little low, or some of us have been laid off at work or lost our job, and in a heartbeat you got yourself cleaning windshields by the Holland Tunnel in New York. (laughs) In one breath. It's all over, right? That's what we do. My personal relationships is another area of self and third column. How I think this relationship should look. Everyone should like me. I should like you. We should be on the same page. One for all, all for one. And you're not liking me. You just had an argument. That's me. You can feel threatened. I have a problem. Basically, because I'm assigning you a role. My self-esteem, how I feel about myself. My sex relation, not only just too much sex, not the right kind of sex. But what I think a man should be and how I think a woman should be. My pocketbook, my money. No one should touch my money. I should not have to pay taxes. You have to pay taxes. I shouldn't have to pay bills. You better pay bills. No one takes my money. It's my money. I am my money. We live in Boca. We live South Florida. A lot of people walk around. I am my money. Right? I am my money. Look at me. I'm rich. I'm great. What happens when the money goes? Because it's on loan from God anyway. It's not my money. My sponsor told me a long time, it's not your money. It's not even your job. It's not even your relation. It's not even your house. God says, here, go play. Be a steward of my stuff. How am I doing with that? My emotional security, what I need to be okay. What I need from you to be okay. And this is a real tip-off to my attachments to external conditions. I need you to do certain things and say certain things, and then my ambition, what I want. Here's the trickster. The first three columns turn out to be, even though they really happen and they're in black and white, the first three columns turn out to be one big lie that my mind has played on me. I get to see my fate, my perceptions and conceptions, my illusion and delusion about everything. I've been living with me and my ego. That's why these things have happened to me. This is why I become angry. My expectations on other people. If I was in the sunlight of the spirit, none of this stuff would affect me. I wouldn't would be hurt into fear or threatened. And what my fourth column reveals to me is what I do because of my feeling hurt, threatened, and interfered in the third column. I become selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. I say certain things. I do certain things. I interpret certain things. We go to coin night, anniversary night, Academy Awards, right? <laughs> so I'm in the back, we'll pretend with my little sponsee who's about to get coin. And everyone's getting applause, and all the sponsees are getting applause, all the sponsors are getting applause, and I'm saying, boy, I worked hard at all and get this guy one year. And when I go up and present, I take four hours to give a presentation <laughs> on what I've created, this one year new. While I'm sitting there, my self-centeredness is saying, hmm, what am I going to do about this? I know I'm going to wow them. I'm going to show them all the work they did. My self-seeking was when I actually go do it. The plotting and the doing, and that is the first truth that I got to see in step four. I got to see me in action. That's the first truth. And those are the things that need to be changed. And I did a fear inventory. I got to see my fears and what I do in the face of fear. What I do in the face of fear is control even more. I need to control. I will run away to control. I will be on you to control. But what do I do in the face of fear? Is all self-reliance, not God-reliance. And my book says, promises me we will outgrow fear based on my relationship with God. Huh? We're not talking about fear where, God forbid, the building's burning down. You say, oh my God, pull the alarm box, let's get out of here. It's fear when I'm sitting on my couch and no one's around. 
and I'm driving in my car or perhaps sitting in an AA meeting and I got the chatter of a thousand voices telling me what, what I'm like, who I should see, where I should be, how much money I should have, and I'm gripped in fear. Oh my God. My voice tells me I'm a loser. I will never amount to anything. And I get gripped in fear. I can't live with that guy anymore. It'll kill me. It'll take me back to a drink. The fear of what people think of how I sound, how I dress, what I drive, where I live, how much money I make. And then the voice in the head that tells me, no matter what I do, you're still a bum, you're still a loser, you're still a, 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 a dope fiend. And you get gripped in fear. Oh, my God. My sponsor used to joke around and he used to do this. I need a job, I need a job, I need a job. Then he gets interviewed. Oh, my God, I got an interview. Oh, my God, an interview. It's always fear. And then I did the sex inventory. Interesting. Uh, when I went to share my fifth step, my first one, when it came to sex inventory, I couldn't even read my own handwriting. It was all scribbly writing. <laughs> Why? Because there was so much shame and guilt behind it. Real men don't do this. Real men don't feel this way. Real men are loyal. Real men practice fidelity. I have none of it. How am I going to share this with another guy? Compromising positions. Oh, my God. Am I going to do this? I don't want to share this. Fear. I'm out. But it was one of my many, many lengths. And when I sat down with my sponsor, we did the whole thing. We came to sex and the attorney says, uh, okay, what are you afraid to tell me? First question, what are you afraid to tell me? In fact, my, my second sponsor did the same thing. What are you afraid to tell me? I said, I'll tell you anything. No, I wasn't. <laughs> and I'm reading it, and I, I'm squinting. Before I was wearing glasses, and I'm squinting. Let me see that. And he didn't make fun of it. He says, how much shame and embarrassment do you have behind this? I said, well, I'm embarrassed to talk about this stuff to another man. He says, we're going to stop. He says, I want you to go home and write inventory on being shameful and embarrassed about your sex inventory. Put it in a fear inventory. And I came back the next day, shared it, and we began. And one of the things he did for me in the fifth step, I'm getting ahead of myself, was he shared some awkward moments that he experienced. His lack of fidelity, his disloyalty, his verbal and physical abuse, and the things that happened to him, etc. He anteed up first because he knew how important this was that he pulled me ashore. So he kind of anteed up. I took a deep breath and off I went. And he never, he never judged it. He just listened. He, he, he kind of guided me through that. I found that I wasn't that different. I wasn't that unique. And more important, I wasn't dirty. I was just broken. It's what I became, the things I did, under the influence or just untreated. That's what we do. This is what I'm capable of doing. Here it is on paper, my fourth step. And what, a, what, a God, what God will do is erase all of it. We will start clean on his terms, not my terms. In fact, doing four and five is really a demonstration of me willing to live on God's terms, not my terms, because on my terms, no one has to know this stuff. I feel good. I got a tan, <laughs> went to the gym, always looking for the external to get right rather than the internal. So I finished the sex inventory, and over the years, I will tell you, my, my teachers have uh, taken the book and uh, switched up some questions to what they call trick the ego, because the ego knows sex inventory is coming, the ego knows fear inventory is coming. So they kind of play with the questions and expand it a little bit, open up the third column, different techniques, different influences out of the book, so the ego doesn't write the inventory. I remember uh, uh, there was a gentleman who's passed on, this guy from California, Joe H. He says, let me hear what you wrote. So I had everything in front of me, and I'm ready to share with Joe H. My, some of my thoughts up over the phone. He's going to say, great, you're Moses, good job. And he laughed. And he says, your ego is all over that. And he had me do this, which was just wonderful. Every resentment I had, he told me, write the opposite. Every fear I had, he told me, write the opposite. And this inventory became like this. But boy, did I get free. I remember going through the work, uh, maybe it was the fifth or sixth time through the work, and uh, I, I'm sitting down to write, and I'm thinking, I probably have about five names, ten names to write. I'll never forget it, 79 names showed up. Because the ego wasn't writing it. The names just kept you know, popping up. Now, for those of us who go through the work more than one time, uh, what I have experienced is this. I might write about mom, the first inventory, first fourth step. 
second, third, fourth, fifth. There's nothing wrong with that. There's more needs to be revealed. Certain things are not, not reconciled yet. So just keep writing. Let the pen be the spiritual translator and keep writing. And I got done with this fourth step, and there was a sense of accomplishment. It was difficult at times, but it was a sense of accomplishment. I will share this. Between ages 8 and 10, I had this, this, this relative, I'll call him a relative, who did inappropriate things with me. And uh, I'm writing about this guy, and it came to the fourth column, and it says, what, where was I at fault? Where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking? I was 8. This guy should have been locked up. And I can feel myself getting agitated and, and angry. And my, I started to relive it. My eyes were watering. I was starting to become teary and angry at the same time. And so I closed the book, and I was really annoyed. And I, I called my sponsor. And the first person I spoke to was his girlfriend. And she was an al on black belt. And bless her heart. And she kind of took me down off the ledge. And uh, my sponsor, his name was Tony. He got on the phone, and uh, we talked a bit. And he shared some things that he went through. And he says, let me ask you a question where you're at fault. He said, never forget, he says, how long have you been hating this man? I said, Tony, I despise him. I, I, if I can get him alone now, I'd probably beat him up. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm not a little kid. He says, that's where you're at fault. Stop hating. Don't have to have a relationship with him. Don't have to hang out with him. Don't even have to like him. Stop hating. And forgiveness was going to be the medicine to fix, to fix me. Forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean we're friends now. It just means I'm off the hook. And somewhere in there, I might let you be instead of cursing you to hell for the rest of my life because as long as I'm doing that, I'm going with you. I got on a plane to Montana. He's coming with me. Forgiveness heals. They've done some studies on this with forgiveness. Something happens within me that heals me in forgiveness. And he says, all you have to do is pray for the willingness to forgive, because you're not there to forgive him yet. You're not in that place yet. Pray for the willingness to forgive this man. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did it. Mocked, tortured, spat out everything. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have said, you know who I am? I can do it. What an order, I can't go through it. Here was one of my any lens facing me. Eyeball to eyeball in, 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 my, in, my, in my fourth step. First, one of the biggest any lens I, I, I came into right at the get-go. Sex inventory. Writing the step down. Resentment inventory. How am I going to do this? But I did it. And we shared about it. And it wasn't so bad. I found that I wasn't dirty. It wasn't my fault. Everything's okay. I'm safe and protected. It was one of those things. And I will tell you this. Um, I've seen this person... Uh, at a few events, and um, I was waiting to get angry. You know, come on, God, give me some anger here. This, this is good. Give me a reason. He was way on the other side, and I was over on this side, and um, I saw him. I didn't feel dirty. I didn't have a movement in me to go punch him in the mouth or say, you know, you, I didn't do anything. I couldn't care. I couldn't care. I was whole again. I was complete. I had dignity and integrity now. And I knew no one could ever do that to me again. My walk is different. And I didn't think much about that feeling. I, I never forget that. I, I wasn't saying, wow, I must be really on a spiritual path. There was no thought of that. It was just, I don't care. I didn't realize how free I had gotten. just out of the mercy of God. Where I had dishonor, I now have glory. That's who we get in alcoholics and honors. What was old become, dies and we get what's new, God. Die to the old to experience the new. It's in any lens that we have to go to, God. So at the beginning, step four seems really difficult. It isn't. It's new. That's why it seems difficult, and we're on a path we never experienced before, but it's one of the any lens. And when we speak to folks in AA who've done uh, 4 through 9, as the book says, into 10, 11, and 12, they are different people from the inside out. 
And when that transformation happens, because AA, we will learn a lot of things, but it's not about getting an education, but it's experience in God, the transformation. When that happens, you're talking to a new person. Some of us don't even look the same after going through this path and living this path. Everything has changed. Perceptions and conceptions about everything has been changed. And really, if you think about it, we go home. We're going back to what God gave us at the beginning. It, we, I call it change, but really, we're looking through the eyes of a child, like we're supposed to be around God, like children around God, in awe of God, the abundance of God. Just having a cup of coffee uh, in the backyard is like I'm having a cup of coffee in my backyard. Oh, my God, this is spectacular. That's being like a child with God. That's what happens to us. The contempt, the poison, the anger, the resentment. There's no time for that anymore. It's been removed. And all I have to do is continue to get soul food and grow with that. Like I said, it's like kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to the work we used to do. That's all I got. Peace. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.